I am an archaeological geneticist. I focus on ancient DNA in the past. Um, but what I'm really interested in is not just the DNA from a particular skeleton, but I want to know about their whole life. I want to know about their life history, the diseases they had, the diets they ate. But unfortunately, very little of that preserves in the archaeological record. And this frustrated me for a very long period of time. And then I hit upon something really interesting. It's called dental calculus. Um, you probably know it by the name tooth tartar. It's a more common name. Um, what it is, it's, it's the dental plaque on the surface of your teeth that mineralizes while you're alive. It actually is the only part of your body that actually fossilizes during life. And this, this entraps and preserves these materials on your teeth for a very long, for a very long time. And what's interesting is that dental plaque is very sticky, lots of things get entrapped in it, and so we actually have this amazing record of behaviors, of uh, all sorts of things that otherwise don't preserve at all, right there sitting on the surface of your teeth that we can then go and mine out of the past. This fascinates me that we now have a window into this invisible world. When I started this research, very few people were thinking about dental calculus. It wasn't very interesting. It's toothed harder. What would you do with that? But the more I started investigating it, the more I started realizing that it preserves DNA for extraordinary periods of time. It preserves proteins for very long periods of time. Also little things like microfossils, fragments of textiles, fragments of, of uh, food particles, um, even things like paints that a person might have used during their lifetime become trapped and then encased in dental calculus and preserved. And as a scientist, we can now use a wide variety of tools to mine those bits of information out and recover entire aspects, not only of the genome of the individual, which is also present in dental calculus, but of all the things they did, the illnesses they had, the life they lived, and the things they ate throughout their life. All the things that we wish we had a window to um, that don't preserve under conventional means, we can get at through dental calculus. Initially, we applied, we applied many methods, in part because I didn't know where to begin. This was a material that has hardly been studied. In fact, for the past 50 years, most of the research that's been done on dental calculus is just how to get rid of it, how dentists can more effectively remove it. There was very little known about the actual biology of the system. So we had to be quite exploratory on our methods. Um, we applied several different ones. So for example, we applied metagenomics, we specifically shotgun metagenomics. This is where you extract all of the DNA in a sample and then sequence all of it. This is a very new technique using next generation sequencing. It's only been available for less than 10 years and we applied this. It's computationally very difficult, generates lots and lots of data, terabytes of data, so it's very complicated to analyze, but it gives you an incredibly detailed window into um, the DNA that's preserved. We also applied a very new technique called uh, shotgun proteomics where we applied tandem mass spectrometry. This is, um, it's only very recently that the instruments have become fast enough and sensitive enough um, to be able to do a bulk extraction of all the proteins that we can recover and then to sequence those or identify the proteins that were originally present. This was a particularly interesting aspect of the study to me because we were the first to apply this to an oral sample, to, to a calculus sample. Um, in this ancient context, but actually was the first time it had ever been done for even modern dental plaques. It was really pioneering. It was very, very exciting. We also applied a number of other methods, uh, conventional microscopy, light microscopy and scanning electron microscopy, Raman spectroscopy. All of these were coming together to try to understand the biology of the system, what minerals were present, um, what types of microfossils might be entrapped. We had very rich information, but I was particularly excited about the metagenomic and the proteomic data. Um, we found uh, really rich sources of biomolecules in here. In the archaeological record in general, ancient DNA and ancient proteins tend not to preserve very well. Uh, what we found in calculus was a very different story. So we now know as a result of this work that dental calculus is the richest source of ancient DNA known in the entire record. In fact, it's on average about 100 to 1,000 times more DNA in calculus than skeleton, skeletal material from the same skeleton. So it's really, really rich. And the same is true for proteins. We don't just find a narrow range of proteins, which is what we typically find from uh, dentin or bone. We find this incredible array of proteins that come from the bacteria, um, that come from the, the human itself, and also from diet. With the human proteins, actually, we don't just get run-of-the-mill proteins. We get very exciting proteins, like immune-associated proteins. And so we were able to reconstruct this entire uh, uh, relationship between the microbes and the host 
right there on the surface of the teeth. So the findings actually far exceeded my expectations. When I started this research, my, my highest hope was that we might recover some oral bacteria that we might be able to associate with, say, dental caries. What I had no idea was that the ancient DNA and proteins that pres were preserved would allow us to reconstruct the entire ancient oral microbiome of this individual and the host response. We have an entire suite of immune proteins that were present and identified that we know are directly involved in um, response to microbial infection. So here we had, uh, in this particular case, we had someone with periodontal disease, and we could see the bacteria involved, the host response, all encapsulated and fossilized for us in time, this detailed uh, relationship. This is incredibly important. If you think about um, how today we're starting to realize the tremendous importance of the microbiome and our overall health, one question has always been, well, how could we ever look in the past? Um, how, where would we ever get it from? And it turns out dental calculus is a fantastic reservoir of the microbiome sitting right there in our mouth, in the mouths of these ancient people. We can go to almost any period in the past. We can radiocarbon date the skeleton and have a snapshot of the oral microbiome. This is fantastic. One of the questions we want to know is, what is the ancestral state of the microbiome? You know, if we think that today in industrialized societies we have a very disturbed microbiome, that we have to know what it used to look like in order to make that comparison. Where does it come from? It turns out we can actually get that information from dental calculus, so it's really rich. So uh, we were able to reconstruct this community of bacteria, that's one thing. We were also able to recover specific genomes from different organisms, from different microbes. One in particular I found really interesting is Tanarella forsythia. It's uh, very associated with um, chronic periodontal disease, and we had so many genetic sequences from it that we could actually reconstruct its entire genome and determined that the particular strain that this individual had in medieval Germany lacked a, a conjugative transposon, which is a genetic element that conveys tetracycline resistance today. And this person didn't have it. Um, so that was very exciting. When we looked at the proteins, we found it was just so interesting. We found salivary amylase, which is something you expect to find. It's in saliva. It helps you digest starch. We also find this enormous range of uh, immune proteins, mostly associated with neutrophils, which is a particular cell type that's engaged in defending you from dental plaque and other microbial infections. Um, and we also found dietary proteins. In another study, we looked at a, a larger number of samples and were able to trace milk consumption all the way back to the Bronze Age by picking out milk proteins from dental calculus. So I find this incredibly exciting. We can get angles of health and we can get angles of diet. And also, microscopically, we see traces of things like fibers. So if you think about clothing, for example, they don't preserve well in the archaeological record, and yet we can go into the dental calculus of individuals and see bits of cotton, bits of flax, um, bits of hemp. And we can then infer what types of clothing people were wearing if they were using uh, people who were working with clothing or have clothing that they're holding in their teeth while they're working on different fabrics. So it's this real window into the past that we've never quite had anything like it. The relevance of these findings is that we now have a new source of human life history, behavior, health, and diet in the past that, that was under our noses the whole time uh, and we didn't know about and now is revealing uh, complex information on a scale that we, we never expected. This is providing information about how the human oral microbiome has evolved and changed through time. We can use this to see how um, changes in human behavior, changes in human society may have impacted our microbiome, which then may impact our health. We also now have this incredible window into microbes, ancient microbes, that we can radiocarbon date, put a date on and see how individual microbes change through time. Um, we've had a long history of coevolution with many of these microbes, and we don't understand these relationships very well. Some of them are actually quite protective against disease for us. And we now have a way of actually going into the archaeological record and finding these microbes. We can actually do archaeological microbiology. This is a completely new area. So I think this is very, very exciting, looking at how microbes evolve through time and how our relationship has changed with them. In terms of moving forward, we're still trying to explore how far we can go with this technology. And everywhere we look, we keep finding new and exciting things. So one aspect is we noticed early on that we could recover human DNA from calculus, but we didn't know what could we do with it? Is there enough to do any kind of interesting research with? So we, we recently conducted a study where we showed you could recover whole mitochondrial genomes from calculus. This is really exciting in cases where you might not be able to analyze the skeletal material for one reason or another. 
We're also really under interested in understanding whether or not calculus might provide an unusual or even a better preservational environment for DNA in general than dentin or bone. The fact that it calcifies during life, effectively sealing off that DNA, seems to have a protective effect on it. It doesn't seem to decompose or undergo the same kind of decay that the rest of the body goes under. So it's very protected. So this reservoir aspect of it is very interesting to me. We're also now starting to apply this to many, many more skeletons. We want to know how far back in the past can we go. Our initial study focused on the medieval period because we wanted a system that we, we understood to a pretty good degree. We wanted to know if the findings made no sense. We know enough about the medieval period to know what we expected to find, and we did find it. This gave us a lot of confidence in our results, and now we can take that um, information and start applying it to deeper and deeper periods in the past. And so we're exploring in many, many directions. We're also further exploring proteins. Uh, it seems like almost every year a new uh, mass spectrometer comes out that can recover even more information. And as we start to apply these technologies, our protein counts are going from 40 to 80 to 100 to 200 to sometimes we even get 700 protein identifications in a single sample. Um, this is including health information, host information, dietary information. We're really, really excited about this. And we're starting to pick up dietary items that otherwise we would never see. And what's also really exciting about the protein work is not only can we say, oh, this person was eating oats, or this person was eating uh, uh, something related to a cow, which you would get from genomic information. We can say, oh, this is specifically oat seed, or this is specifically cow milk. And when it comes to milk, we can not only say that it's milk, we can say it's cow milk, it's sheep milk, it's goat milk. We can actually distinguish it. So proteins, because they're tissue specific, we can actually say, what specific foods were eaten, and that gets really exciting. This is a completely new area. So right now we're pushing the limits of all the technologies that we have at our fingertips um, to try to reach the limit, which we haven't reached yet, of how much, we can, how much information we can really extract from this material.